Good evening. Welcome to API's Eye on Government program for Thursday, April 29th, 2021. Eye on Government brings you the latest on government's plans, programs, policies, and projects. I am Bavin Olver. Just ahead on this evening's program, we'll learn more about those persons currently staying in emergency shelters nationwide. The country receives supplies from Jamaica and the British Virgin Islands. These stories are more just ahead, but first, let's join Howard John for Newswatch. Hello, good evening. Thanks for joining us for News Watch for Thursday, April 29, 2021. I'm Hala John. The National Emergency Management Organization, NEMO, is cautioning potential dangers in the red and orange zones due to mud flows within the river systems. According to information received from the scientists at the Belmont Observatory, there were Laha flows within the river systems in the red and orange zones in recent days. Lahars are a dense mixture of ash and water. This usually occurs during heavy rainfall, which creates mud flows that destroy everything in its path as it rushes down the volcano's slopes faster than a river. The lahars can pose a danger to persons visiting the red and orange zones. As a result of this, the Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force will be restricting persons traveling into the red and orange hazard zones. According to the Meteorological Services of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, occasional showers are expected to continue during the course of the day and will extend into the end of the week. Residents and motorists should remain alert due to the rain-soaked ash and possible poor visibility. The National Emergency Management Organization, NEMO, is also urging persons to desist from visiting the red and orange volcanic hazard zones due to potential danger. The United Nations General Assembly on Wednesday, April 28, 2021, adopted a resolution, Solidarity with and Support for the Government and People of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, as well as neighboring countries affected by the impact of the eruptions of the La Sofre volcano. The resolution was introduced by the representatives of Guyana, speaking on behalf of the Caribbean community CARICOM, and adopted without a vote. Within the resolution, it states that the Assembly is deeply concerned about the serious consequences of the explosive eruption of the last of volcano in St. Vincent and the Grenadines since April 9, 2021, which has resulted in the displacement of residents and the loss of livelihoods, food security and nutrition, health security and access to social infrastructure, and about the urgent need to restore normal conditions for the population and further welcoming the generous and immediate assistance that has been provided by the Caribbean community and neighboring countries and by other states and national, regional and international organizations, in particular the United Nations system to alleviate this emergency situation in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The resolution concludes with a request to the Secretary General to the extent of his authority to support the rehabilitation efforts that are being made by the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines as well as affected neighboring countries. The AFIA Foundation, JetBlue, and the Commission for the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, OECS, are working together to deliver much-needed relief supplies to the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The first in a series of shipments arrived in St. Lucia on Friday, April 23rd via JetBlue for immediate onward shipment to St. Vincent. The relief supplies include urgently needed items such as face masks, face shields, blankets, gloves, isolation gowns, and adult diapers. Director General Dr. Didius Jules, in a recent statement, officially thanked the organization for the generous contributions and collaboration to expeditiously get supplies to St. Vincent. The Director General also expressed thanks to medical professionals on the move and direct relief who played a role in helping the OECS to connect with the AFIA Foundation. In a brief statement following the successful first shipment of supplies, founder and CEO of the AFIA Foundation, Daniel Butin, reiterated the organization's commitment to provide continued medical assistance to the Eastern Caribbean region. 
He said it was the honor of the organization to support the remarkable work of the OECS with AFIA's medical and humanitarian relief supplies. He also said that this is a long-term commitment to help bolster and support medical infrastructure in the Eastern Caribbean states so they can restore and recover. The OECS Commission launched the Stronger Together campaign as an official emergency response on behalf of the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. All funds raised via this campaign will be directly transferred to the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. For more information, please visit www.oecs.org. International Jazz Day 2021, dedicated to the memory of national treasure Ellsworth Shea Keen, is being celebrated in St. Vincent and the Grenadines this Friday, April 30th, 2021. It is perhaps fitting that this celebration of jazz is being organized, even as St. Vincent and the Grenadines continues to grapple with the aftermath of the ongoing eruption of the last of Frere volcano, which was the subject of a poem by the world-renowned poet. The event, which is being celebrated here for the third consecutive year, is being organized by the Artist Club, SVG Inc. The main activities this Friday will include a symposium to be carried on International Jazz Day SVG Facebook page and other social media platforms with the participation of musicians, intellectuals, and historians discussing the legacy of Sheikh Keen. This will run from 9 to 11 a.m. and will be moderated by journalist and the host of the program Jazz Tropical, Dexter Rose. The second activity, which kicks off at 7 p.m., will be a celebratory concert under the direction of Cuban-born guitarist and music teacher at the Thomas Saunders Secondary School, Ray Escobar. We are already are in the International Jazz Day map. You can find it and we'll see the only country in the Lesser Antillas right now who is doing it. We are the one. We have the poster already there. You can find the description, the description, sorry, my English, um, the description of all the musicians who are being playing uh, right now online. All the, the music that we're gonna do is gonna be shared in the international jazz page. So it's, it's a world event. It's a very important world event. It's um, have the sponsorship in the world from UNESCO because it's an UNESCO uh, very important day, the International Jazz Day. A third event is carded for May 2nd, a concert offered by Epsilon Music Academy, which will feature students of that institution led by director Zahili Sariol Lidlow. And finally this evening, the SVG Gospel Fest Committee, as part of activities for Digital SVG Gospel Fest 2021, will be staging a special weekend of praise. The weekend of praise, which is scheduled for Friday, April 30th to Sunday, May 2nd, will be held at the Russell's Auditorium in Stony Grounds. On Friday, April 30th, will be the Symphonies of Praise at 7 p.m. On Saturday, May 1st, Dance Praise from 6 p.m. And Sunday, May 2nd, Evening of Thanksgiving from 6 p.m. Weekend of Praise will involve leading gospel artists, church leaders, and government officials from across the country. The purpose is to give God thanks and praise in this time of a national disaster. That's it for News Watch for Thursday, April 29, 2021. I'm Hala John. Stay tuned. Iron Government continues in a few moments. Hi, I'm Kim Halvish, one of the managing directors of Paradise Beach Hotel and Fantasy Tours. I'm also the president of the St. Vincent and Grenadines Hotel and Tourism Association. Today, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my vaccine experience. I had it three weeks ago and I was one of the fortunate ones. There was a little soreness at the vaccination site for one day, and I felt a little weak during the night of the same day I took the vaccine, and the next morning I was fine. So I'm encouraging everyone to get on board and get vaccinated, because that's the only way our hospitality industry will open and we have been suffering for over a year. It's been really hard for us. So I was ready to be first in line to get the vaccine and to get the ball moving. It's inevitable where in order to get back to business as usual, we'll all need to be vaccinated. Get vaccinated today.
Welcome back. You're watching the API's Iron Government. Life in a shelter is taking a lot of adjusting for many people. In the Mario Quo Valley, where there are a number of shelters, the API visited to see how families are coping with this new normal. Moat Games has the details. Thank you. We are in the valley, the Mario Quo Valley. And in the valley, we have covered six shelters. We've started at the Learning Resource Center in Marroqua and we are ending here at the Marroqua Government School. Take a journey with us as we speak to the evacuees and the shelter managers across the Marroqua Valley. So Mrs. Bracken, this is your home away from home. Yeah. Tell us how you feel about being here. Well, it's a challenge because you know you're still thinking about your home and how it is right now so it's a challenge being you know like having to be away from home but the staff here has made all of us pretty comfortable they like i get treated better than how i was when i was home so you know it it is a challenge but um they try to make us as comfortable as possible so can't complain what would you say have been your brightest moment so far uh, my brightest moment so far, let me see. Hmm. Um, I would say is seeing that God is in the midst of it. There is um, the staff here. They kind of draw us out, you know, from that comfort zone that we are in. And they bring us to like, it's like they get us to realize that even though we are going through all of what we are going through, we are still being protected by the Almighty God. So, um... I would say that is my brightest moment, the staff here. I didn't know people could be this um, nice and this, you know, god fair. And it's like a refreshing, a refreshing breath in the midst of all this chaos now. We're here with Mrs. Phyllis John Primus. And Mrs. Phyllis John Primus is actually one of the staff here at the Marocco Learning Resource Center that is housing some of the persons who have been displaced from the threat of the Lasso Fair volcano. Mrs. Primus, share with us what has been some of the challenges so far? All right, um, we are at the Marocco Learning Resource Center. We started in terms of occupancy the Friday. So we opened the Thursday, but then we actually start receiving evacuees on the Friday. The challenge per se was more in terms of the um, certain aspects of the building really the plumbing and water. But since then we were able to address them with the assistance of Nemo and Braxa. They really came and addressed the issues once we reported them. Okay, how much evacuees do you have? Um, we have registered 27 persons. Um, amongst them are a baby, 10 months, up to 77 years old. We have two persons, however, out of the 27 who would leave from time to time to private shelter. One is a college student and another who visits our grandmother. But that was for a brief mind. So right now, 25 occupants. Okay, we know that Nemo has been encouraging persons who are staying in private homes to at least register with the nearest center. Do you have any such persons? Yes, we have persons housed in private shelters registered across in terms, in terms of the location of the private shelters that is in several villages in this zone. So we have 25 persons. Yeah. Okay, you mentioned the diabetic and the hypertension. Tell us about the role of the nurses within the community. Do they come in and make sure that these patients are being taken care of in terms of their, their daily checks? Oh, yes. Um, so our district staff nurse, Mrs. Robertson, she comes daily to check in with the hypertensive and anybody else who rep reports a complaint. Um, she would make whatever referrals or check with the district doctor. Um, also, we have the district sister, James, and the family nurse practitioner, Sister Alfred. They would visit, visit us weekly, check in with everyone to ensure that they are well, assess the children, the hypertensive, diabetic, even the person who is mentally challenged to encourage them. Um, also, we have great support from our counsellor, 
Mrs. Isaacs. She is in charge of this zone and so she will visit to ensure too that the evacuees are well. Also to the district um, pharmacist um, came already twice and would have refilled prescriptions for the persons who on medication. Um, we have access to the dentist. I know one person have already utilized that service. Finally, in the midst of all of this, how have you been able to ensure that the COVID-19 protocols are being adhered to? Oh yes, that is um, of paramount importance. We encourage and we, I won't say enforced, but we encourage uh, mask wearing, sanitizing and temperature checks on a daily basis, twice actually morning and afternoon because we would have movements at times. If you're now joining us, we are here in the Marocco Valley and this is the Evisham Methodist School. Good afternoon, my name is Randy. Randy Cordes, they call me Randy Spartan from Sandy Bay. So Mr. Spartan, we, we have learned that Sandy Bay is in a devastating state. I'm not sure at what point did you move out. So tell us at um, what time did you move out? I moved out the, the Thursday, the Thursday before the, um, the actual eruption. I get here around, um, say, about midnight. Because it was, I was there with my girlfriend because she was part of the Red Cross team. So they were trying to get everybody out first before we actually moved from Sunday Bay. And how challenging was that? Um, it was a bit challenging because as soon as the evacuation order was given, people start getting their stuff ready, start getting at the, um, the muster points. And they were just wait, they were waiting until about minutes to eight where we, um, the first bus that came to take parcels out. Um, it was a bit stressed because people they, was there waiting. They were saying they said to um, to evacuate and they can't get any transportation. So it was a kind of was a challenging experience. Have you had a chance to go up since things seem to have been a little quiet? Yeah, I went up twice. I went up twice to get some stuff. Um, you know, being away from home, any some stuff to keep yourself comfortable. So I went out there after the the, the eruption and I saw the, the devastation um, impact that the last of three have, have done. And a bit of tears come to my eyes because you know it's a community that I grew up in. To see what happened to it now is is really very emotional. Anytime I go back out there, uh, look at the pics. Now tell us about life at the shelter. How satisfied are you? We know that you won't be totally satisfied because it's not home. Yeah. But we still have to make where we are comfortable. Tell us about, about your, your shelter life at the moment. Uh, the life here was, was is a, is a, is a kind of hard one. Knowing that it was comfortable home, comfortable lying on the own bed. I had to come here and, you know what I mean, you had to sleep on a desk with a mattress, you know what I mean. It's, it's, it's a total different. But when I get here, when I get here on the first night, the, the, the shelter team was very calm. They was acceptable. Um, I, I get things for eat the same night I came here. I was expecting to come here and get something to eat. That's the first thing they welcome me with. And I see that they, they want to make us feel comfortable as possible. The, 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 the teachers here, everybody's friendly. Um, I, can't, I can't complain. The, 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 the meals on time. So here is, I feel comfortable here. I feel like we live here, man. <laughs> I feel like we live here, trust me. So what would you say has been your biggest challenge since living at the shelter? Um, well, in the first week was basically water. Water was the main issue and now water is back. That was like last week, I think. Water, is, water was the main issue here. Final question, what do you consider to be the sweetest moment throughout all of this? Um, the food. Food. <laughs> I can't complain, I can't complain. Food and the environment here is, is, is just, just calm and everything. In terms of managing the shelter, tell us how many persons you have on, on, on campus. All right, well, we currently have 35 persons on campus. The numbers was uh, 40, but due to certain issues, they had to leave right under the instructions from Nemo. So we currently have 35. I think there are just four of them are single, 
males and the rest are family, families in their different compartments. Through this crisis, what would you say, how, how would you rate the success in terms of housing the evacuees? Well, we were preparing for this from since January. So, to be honest, it wasn't something that we were not prepared for because we would have attended um, training sessions from Nemo, virtually that is. Um, we had our meetings right here in school or physical meetings where we would have debriefed the other staff members about what to expect, how to prepare. So we basically had everything in place and on the day of the, um, when the evacuation order was given, we were already prepared for accepting them. So things were, you know, rather successful in a sense. Yeah. I noticed that we have quite a number of children here at this shelter. Tell yeah. us how do we cater for their needs? Well, for the children, well, the shelter management team is basically teachers, so they love their job, as you know. So they decided to create a corner, a children's corner. I guess I'll take you there to, for you to see. And in that corner, they normally teach them a little Bible story and stuff like that, and like basic stuff that would keep them, you know, entertained or educated. What so, has been the most challenging moment so far? I guess early up, the lack of water and basically I just I guess that was it. What would you say is the biggest takeaway in all of this? I, don't know, I guess these people from over the river are really really good with their mindset. They are so calm while we here in the safe zone are rather frightened about the volcano. I mean, we are here in the safe zone. They are coming from the red zone and they're so calm about things. They, they're just filled with, with life, with little to no care at all. Different than the fact that their house, you know, some of them would have had their house roof, you know, broken in from the ash or their house would have been broken into by thieves, but they still maintain, you know, a calm persona and that, that's really nice for me to see and I, I like it. Up next, we'll visit evacuees at various shelters in and around the capital. Welcome to Opportunity Calls, where we inform you on vacancies within the government service, opportunities for training, scholarships and much more. Stay tuned as an opportunity might just be calling you. The Government of Japan is inviting applications for Japanese government scholarships from citizens of St. Vincent and the Grenadines who wish to pursue postgraduate study at Japanese universities under the Japanese Government MEX Scholarship Program. Application deadline May 31st, 2021. For more information on the scholarship and how to apply, please visit our Facebook page at API. SVG. Welcome back. As a result of the explosive eruption of La Soufrère, many persons have had to leave their homes and stay in emergency shelters nationwide. The API's Janice St. Philip visited the Grammar School, Lodge Village Primary, New Testament Church of God, Wilson Hill, and the Sign Hill Government School. On Friday, April 9th, many Vincentians had to face the grim reality of an explosive eruption in the Blessed Land, Hiruna. Residents in the Red Zone had to evacuate their homes and seek sanctuary in mostly schools, utilized as emergency shelters. In a quest 
to visit various placements where evacuees are housed, the API ventured to four locations to get shelter updates on Sunday, April 25, 2021. The shelters visited were the Grammar School, Lodge Village Primary School, the New Testament Church of God, Wilson Hill, and the Sign Hill Government School. The first shelter visited was the Grammar School, where shelter manager Randy Boucher took us on a tour of the shelter and provided information on the operations of the shelter. At this particular shelter, St. Vincent Grammar School, we have 140 evacuees as of yesterday. They are mainly from Georgetown. Chateaubelle, we have some from Chateaubelle, Pettibodel and Fitus. Most of them are from the Georgetown area. Um, we have 49 of the 140 are children and I think we balance in the 40s in terms of adult male and adult female. We have a few elderly of course amongst us and three babies um, as well. Um, to date we have two of our evacuees who are pregnant ladies as well. So that comprises the persons who are here at the shelter. In terms of our products that we have here in terms of stuff of course shelter gets its stuff from nemo in a short while we'll take you across to the kitchen area where the bulk of our stuff that comes from nemo is stored Bouch expressed how connections were made to procure supplies and the significant amount of support that they have received from government and private entities we also have some snacks and so forth that was donated just yesterday from the Prime Minister's office. We have those in storage in terms of drinks and so forth. Another quantity came from the Prime Minister's office as well. And of course, Nemo, ECGC, Rotary, and so forth we have in here. Caswall, also known as Bowley, an evacuee and a young mother with a baby, gave their viewpoints regarding their experiences at the shelter. I originally from Shadowbelle, Fitchews village, run from the volcano, find myself in by the grammar school, and then I can't really complain about nothing. Everything is nice here, meeting Mr. Boucher and all the rest of the teachers good treatment from each and every one. Hi, I'm from Georgetown and I had to evacuate, be, evacuate because of the volcano. And when I came at the first time, it was very difficult because I had the baby and stuff. And when I started to relax, it was very hard because the baby was very fussy from a different environment and it was very stressful. Then after a while, when I soaked in, it was okay. It started to be okay, no problem. And everything, if I want something, I go down by the office, I ask for it and they will give it to me. And they help me a lot, a lot with the baby. The shelter manager showed the kitchen area where the cooking takes place and meals are distributed. In fact, we were able to interact with the cooking crew and spoke with one of the cooks at the grammar school emergency shelter. So we volunteer and we say we go come in the kitchen. When our part, we go do our part. If food coming, food coming. But when we have to do our part, we do skylark with that. We come after tea, we know we have to cook. Pat and the fire, be 10 minutes till have food done. The next stop was the Lodge Village Primary School that houses 160 persons. Shelter manager Jolene Lavia tells us more. The supplies, the supplies that we usually get, we do get from Nemo. They are our, one of our biggest suppliers. We do get our supplies from Nemo, as well as some private companies that usually donate on a daily basis. Where, uh, where do the majority of the evacuees come from? At okay. The well, the majority of them are from North Leeward and they consist of persons from um, Fitzhughes and Chateaubelle. We do have one lady from Georgetown. 
that is staying here with us. After seeing a tour of the kitchen, residents of the shelter made a few remarks. This is my first time of experience de la Souffre. When I was small, they said the Souffre blow, but I didn't experience it before, so this is the first time. And I'm so grateful to be here, and I'm so glad that I have walked in here with them, hand in hand and everything, because we are from the same community, so I think that is something good to experience, and, I'm, yeah, and I like it. We evacuate from the Souffre, but we have to thank God that we are at the shelter. We're getting good food, everything is good, and the people them nice, but otherwise than that, everything good, and we have to thank God we are alive today. The New Testament Church of God at Wilson Hill was the third place to get an update, as Tyson Haynes, the shelter manager, gave an inside look. The majority of our persons come from the labor side, um, mostly Chatwele. We have one person from Georgetown. In terms of um, supplies, we, this week's supply has been coming a bit slowly, um, but in term, we have water, yes, we have water, um, food stuff, it's kind of um, going. One of the volunteers, Sherika John, gave a synopsis of what happens in the kitchen and the persons who have contributed to its functionality. On a daily basis, um, there are caterers from time to time. Sometimes um, it may or may not be enough at times. So we at the shelter here, as I said before, Sister Joe, who, who would have been spearheading the cookery team, we would always prepare stuff just in case that um, in the event that what the caterer would bring is not sufficient, that we can add to the lunch for those, for all the persons who are registered here. The final location for the day was the Sign Hill Government School. We got insight into what supplies are available and how persons have donated from the shelter manager, Nadia Windsor. Presently, we have 38 evacuees here. We have eight boys, 16 adult males, five girls and nine women here. The evacuees here, they're from Sandy Bay and Georgetown. So when the eruption took place, the next day we saw donations coming from persons in surrounding areas. Some of them, they don't want their names mentioned, but some, some persons like the church right up to the hill, Pastor Harry, and we even got food the next day from Lance because we didn't prepare anything and they were, the, the evacuees were able to get food. So we might, I, I keep saying this, this school is a blessed school because even to this day, we would see donations like we just got some clothes there from somebody in the area. And when you look around the room, you would see we have supplies and that's from companies like Musty Company and other private persons and also Nemo. Thank you, Nemo. Sometimes they, 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 um, whatever we ask for, it will come not when we want it to, but we will still get it. We found Kenville Thomas, an evacuee, to speak about himself and how he is coping. Since I'm here, I am feel comfortable. I feel like I'm home. Everything is okay here with me and my family as well. Just waiting until when they have to come that you have to go back home. home. To date, over 16,000 Vincentians have been displaced across the nation and have had to seek temporary residence in emergency shelters, private homes and hotels since the La Souffre explosively erupted on Friday, April 9, 2021. The two other notable volcanic eruptions occurred in 1902 and 1979. I am Janice St. Philip, reporting for the API. Up next, the API visits some shelters on the leeward side of the island. As we battle the unseen enemy, COVID-19, remember to be kind to each other, be a good neighbor, 
Help someone less fortunate than yourself. Be your brother's keeper. Together, we can overcome COVID-19. A message by the National Reconciliation Advisory Committee. Welcome back. You're watching the APIs and Government. As displaced persons settle into temporary housing at evacuation shelters across the country after the explosive eruption of the last Forever volcano, the APIs Yinka Chambers visited shelters at Barley and Roland Hill to get a sense of how they are coping. In the aftermath of the explosive eruptions of the last Forever volcano, a majority of the designated evacuation centers were activated. Efforts are continually being made to make the centers, which mostly comprise schools, resource centers, and churches, safer, more structurally sound, and dual purpose to accommodate the needs of the displaced. For the past two and a half weeks, families are being housed in these temporary shelters as the volcano remains active. Though the displaced families have been feeling the burden of life in transit, the managers of these facilities have been endeavouring to make them feel as safe and comfortable as can be. We are here today with Mrs. Abraham, a retired teacher, and she is the shelter manager of the Rillan Hill Resource Centre. How many persons do you have housed here at this um, shelter? Currently we have 40, 23 females adult females and 17 adult males and 10 children and these persons are from what area mainly Maybe from Rosewell. we have one from chatibele and one from rosebank the gentleman he's the oldest one 79 years um what was the initial process like getting persons um settled into the shelter well in terms of settling in beds having th places for them to sleep and so on that was easily sorted out because you got things from Nemo, so it wasn't really hard after that. And in terms of the persons themselves being prepared um, to move from their homes and, and settle into what is now their new home, how were they prepared? Well, they were prepared because they brought stuff with them, although some were reluctant to leave their home because having lived in a settled environment to come into a new environment, no matter how prepared you are, you will still have some people who are disoriented, you know, and they didn't want to leave the home, etc. you know. Yeah. But now that they've settled, things are working out fine for us because you get help from the community. Everybody pitching, pitches in. The churches in the community, mainly the Nazarene Church, the Baptist Church, the Anglican Church. They all come in and they, they, they participate. We have people in the community as well who cater for them in terms of meals. And we have been so fortunate in that we have several caterers. So during the day, we sometimes have four sets of food. So what we do, those who are in private homes, we share the food with them. The breakfast, the lunch, the dinner, when you have over. And um, in terms of challenges with water and so on, how are you coping with that? Well, luckily we have tanks in the back. So we were never really out of water. When we become a little bit low, um, CWS is step in and we get water. And luckily we have water tanks of spring in the area, Vermont close by, so we were never really short of water. So water is okay. Yes. And in security wise and uh, having children around and, and so on with school and all of that, how, how are you coping with those yeah, we have, aspects? We have, luckily we have teachers on board who are volunteers, so they normally do have activities with children. And yesterday, fortunately, we were gifted some tablets for all the children. That is even much better now. And security have the police. But we have an enclosed surroundings. But Officer Nero has been quite helpful in that area. He checks regularly. And so far, despite that you have senior males and staff and, and members of, of the shelter, we don't have any problem as such. Everyone has been cooperating, you know, doing their, their bits. Because if you know it's outside the, the law and outside, those who are the men who are on the compound, those are the ones who clean the yard. Volunteers from all over the country visit the centers in various capacities to assist in making the evacuees feel at home. The Barley Learning Resource Center houses 38 residents and also caters for displaced persons living in private homes.
the shelter manager at this facility gives us a tour. What are things here at your shelter? Well, things are shaping up pretty nicely here, I must say. We started off very rocky, but as the days go by, we pick up and we are okay for the time being. How many persons do you have housed at your shelter? I have 38 at the moment housed, but however, we have 74 registered. So you cater for persons um, that are living in private homes in terms of meals and so on? Yes, please. They do come in from time to time, almost every day, for lunch or for toiletries, whatever we can give to them. Um, the children that are here, how are you catering to their educational needs? Okay, during the day from about 10 to 12, we have some persons coming in and doing little talks with them. Also, we are doing some occupational therapies where they are doing some crafts, they're learning to make things with their hands. And the younger ladies and males, they are making bonnets. This is one that I have on. They make it right here in this um, institution. In terms of the persons who are here, where are they from originally? Most of them are from Chatibile, but we do have a mixed crowd. We have a few from Rose Bank, and we have some persons from Rose Hall as well. And how many children do you have? 18 to be exact. We have 10 boys, 8 girls. The youngest is one year old, one year to 19. And in terms of supplies for the baby and for mommy and everybody is covered? Yes, yeah, supplies is covered. We get stuff coming all the time. So I stay in it, even if there's a problem, I can always assist. So here is where I house everything. We try to put them in order so that as soon as you need something, you know where to grab it from. What I do, I make packages at night. So I give out a package according to the individual need. Somebody in the community wanted to help and they asked about our immediate need and I expressed to them that privacy. We need a lot of privacy here because if you notice, we have a mixed group and it is an open space. So we are in the process of putting this on the screen so as to help with the privacy. Kevin Jessamy, a local pastor and community activist, says that a company with which he is associated have taken a special interest in the shelters in the central Leeward area and has an ongoing relationship with them. We saw the need of persons living in the shelters, especially in the community of Barley. Um, most of these persons are from Chateaubelair, uh, Rose Hall, Spring Village, down, down that Leeward side. What we've done is that we provided 100 lunches um, a week or so ago to the three shelters, the Learning Resource Center, the Barley Government School Shelter, and the Central Leeward Secondary School Shelter. Um, we also provided water um, as well as snacks for all the kids. The Barley Technical Institute houses four families, a total of 40 persons, mainly from the North Leeward constituency. Following a short sit-down with the shelter manager, the team was invited to tour the facility and spoke with a number of the evacuees who had nothing but good things to say about the caretakers of the shelter. On mornings, right, the children, well, we usually have an activity for them, starting from 11.30 to 12.30, where a primary school teacher would come in and have a literacy session with them. In the an afternoons now, from about 2 o'clock, we have some staff here, along with some volunteers, they would come in and have Bible sessions with them. We came over here the 8, so that was the day before the eruption, and we came and we cleaned up the school and whatnot, and set it up for them. And persons that are being housed here, when they moved, that initial process of settling in and getting space prepared for everyone. How was that like? Well, at first, for them, I think it was a bit uncomfortable. However, some persons went back down for some stuff, and we also loaned them some stuff, and they made themselves comfortable. How are things here at the shelter? Good. Can't complain because we're not in our home, and we have to satisfy, and we need good people. 
you got the shelter management, the teachers, and so they are very nice people. So good. I said I'm not moving because I don't want to go by no shelter, jumble up. But now the shelter are comfortable. I just, at least I have no struggle. Yeah, but I'm not hungry now, nothing. Yeah, but otherwise, under any workers of them, they might live good with them, they cooperate, they might show our love. Do you cook? What do you do? Well, we have to use what the one that you have on tail. <laughs> okay. Everything is okay. The staff and the shelter manager, everything goes to make sure they take care of you. Yeah. All right. I try to make myself comfortable. Okay. All right. Thank you for talking to us. Thank you. We're ending our shelter tour at the Barry Technical Institute with a friendly game of snake and ladder. For the API, I am Yinka Chambers. Up next, this country's CARICOM neighbors continue to show their love and solidarity. Diabetes is among the top three leading causes of death. Are you living with diabetes? If so, you may be at risk for developing complications, especially during this COVID pandemic. Let's tackle this problem by complying with taking your medication, increasing your physical activities, increasing eating a balanced and nutritious diet, checking your feet as foot care is important, and contacting your healthcare provider. Remember, diabetes can lead to blindness, amputation and numerous harmful and life-threatening effects. Protect yourself. Know your numbers. Hearts Movement SVG reminds you to love your body and treat it right. Your health is shared responsibility. Welcome back. The outpouring of love and support to this country continues in the aftermath of the Las Ufres volcanic eruptions. On Tuesday the 27th of April 2021, Minister of Agriculture the Honorable Supporter Caesar and Minister of Tourism the Honorable Carlos James officially accepted two shipments of relief supplies from the British Virgin Islands, BVI and Jamaica respectively. Here's more. Since the eruption of the La Sofre volcano, our neighbors from far and near have extended their arms to the government and people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. From them, we have received a massive outpouring of love in the form of water, water tanks, food supplies, bedding, and toiletries, among other much-needed items for persons displaced in the aftermath of the eruptions. I wish to take this opportunity to thank the government and people of the British Virgin Islands for their love and gratitude that we are witnessing this morning sent to us in this our time of great need. I can recall a few years ago when I went up with a, a delegation to the British Virgin Islands when they were affected by Hurricane Maria and Irma. And, uh, during that period, we were able to unite our forces with the people of the British Virgin Islands. And it's really good to see the return of solidarity. Of course, when we did it, we did not do it looking for anything in return. But at this point in time in our national development, when we are working with different persons across the world to see how we can salvage different areas that are affected, it is really good to see that our brothers and sisters in the British Virgin Islands, that they are basically come forward and assisting us deeply. Making the trip to Port Kingston was a member of the British Virgin Islands Constabulary and Public Relations Officer of the Caribbean Federation of Police Welfare Associations, Sergeant Sean McCall. McCall said the relief items came from several groups within the British Virgin Islands. Social groups like Rotary, the police, the nurses, customs, Red Cross all coming together to lend a helping hand. Uh, we could remember the solidarity you showed to us back in 2017 with Hurricanes Omar and Maria and no doubt it didn't take us 
any effort at all to get our gear in, in progress to meet this, the, this contribution to the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Um, on board we have water, we have bedding, we have toiletries, essential supplies that is needed in this great time of need. Um, we are certain that someday you will rebound and with a little helping hand and a little love from the BVI, we'll make it. And I know that there's also another vessel should be inbound within a day or two with other supplies from the BVI, which will go to friends and family. And we don't mind from the BVI to share the BVI love and reach out a helping hand. Minister of Tourism and Area Representative for North Leeward, Honorable Carlos James, was on hand to witness the arrival of the supplies. Minister James described the donations as a massive show of solidarity and support from the government and people of the British Virgin Islands. And it shows you that the Caribbean connection and the love that is spread across the, the archipelago of the Caribbean yes. is, is well received and recognized. Yes. And I want to say this because the Caribbean region, the government and the people of our Caribbean region, CARICOM and, and its member states, they have, they have stood with us in this time of, of, of need and our time when we need the assistance here to come to St. Vincent. They were forced to respond, they have done it and they continue to show that the Caribbean solidarity that is so vibrant and strong within us and we have to keep this going. On the said morning, the HMBS Lawrence Major, a Bahamian Defense Force vessel, docked in Port Kingston with supplies from Jamaica. Ministers Caesar and James, along with Honorary Consul of Jamaica to St. Vincent Town of the Grenadines, Mrs. Maureen Williams, were present to welcome the contingent and accept the various donations. I take this opportunity to thank the government and people of the Bahamas for allowing the use of their vessel that was en route to dry dock in, in Suriname. I decided to go to Jamaica to assist with bringing cargo to St. Vincent and the Grenadines as a part of the humanitarian relief efforts. We are one region, we are one people, we are one Caribbean and I could recall a few months ago I took the opportunity to come to the Bahamas when you were affected by, by the hurricane. It's indeed our pleasure and privilege to assist in any way we can for the recovery efforts and disaster relief efforts of, Saint of the St. Vincent people. During the path of Dorian and after Dorian, we would have been assisted by our Caribbean brothers. So we know what it is to require help and to get help from our Caribbean brothers. We bring, we transport these stuff on behalf of the Jamaican government en route um, to dry docking in Suriname. And we lay here call to service to assist in any way we can to assist our regional brothers. Thank you. It is my pleasure to be able to stand here to talk about the donation from Jamaica. As we've all been saying, we're one Caribbean. And this, this is a combined effort from the government and people of Jamaica. We have involvement from civil society. We have the private sector. We have NGOs as well. And this is the first of other donations to come. And we are very grateful to the Bahamian government for allowing us the use 
so to speak, of the HMBS Major Lawrence. Lawrence. Yes, and for transporting these to um, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And we trust that this will go a long way in assisting the government and people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. This is my home for 38 years, and I am very happy to be a part of this this morning. Our brothers and sisters in the Caribbean, their solidarity, their support, whatever little they have that they're able to give us from it, has really shown remarkable courage and support of our Caribbean brothers and sisters. And I want to say that the people of North Leeward and North Windward who are most adversely affected from this volcanic eruption. Commanding officer of the HMBS Lawrence Major kindly extended an invitation to the API to tour the vessel. Hi, my name is uh, Sub Lieutenant Faxon. I'm the Operation Officer and Navigation Officer on board HMBS Lawrence Major. Uh, my responsibility include all operational activities, uh, like coming alongside. That'll be myself on the throttles and the coxswain will be on the wheel. Um, any evolution as in uh, timings and stuff like that, that, that fall under my navigational uh, responsibilities. And have a big portfolio also, the weapon officer as well. So that's basically me. Okay. How was the trip and how many hours it took? Well it, well, it took five days to arrive here. And uh, we had like probably like the first, the first two days was pretty rough. And then it leveled out and um, it wasn't too bad. The last day was the best. And so it was, and it's not a, too bad out there right now. Wow. Oh. So is it the first time you're coming to St. Vincent? Uh, yeah, that's the first time coming to St. Vincent. Uh, the last time we uh, rented some aid, we went to Dominica. I think that was like probably like three years ago or something like that. And yeah, that's the first time in St. Vincent. Caribbean is one family and you know, uh, the government afforded us the opportunity to come down and uh, render assistance and we're always, we're always ready. Thank you for affording us this little tour. We wish you all the best going back and convey our thanks and gratitude to the people of the Bahamas, yes, for lending the ship to bring the aid from Jamaica. Thank you and all the best. Thank you for your hospitality. Reporting for Iron Government, I am Keisha Woodley. The public is asked to take note of the following announcement. Public assistance for the month of May 2021 will be paid in the following areas on the following dates from 9.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Monday, May 3rd, Connery. Please note that the payments for Owea, Fancy, Sandy Bay and Overland will be made at the Geeshed Boxing Plant. Tuesday, May 4th, Kingstown, Kittels, Vermont, Leyu and Bookment. Thursday 6th, Lomans Windward, Greggs, Bayabu, Mariqua, Stubbs, Caliqua and Belair. Friday 7th, please note that the payments for the following areas will be made at the Barrelly Revenue Office. Tremoka, Chateau Belair, Spring Village, Coles Hill, Rose Bank and Rose Hall. Revenue Office, Tuesday 11th, Barrelly. Thursday 13th, the payment for Georgetown will be made at the Geeshed Boxing Plant. Friday 14th, Mariqua, Union Island and Canawan. Please note that all persons collecting public assistance are asked to wear their mask as a COVID-19 protocol. All missed payments will be made on May 14th, 2021 at the Geeshed Boxing Plant in Kingstown except for those in North Leeward who can collect their payments at the Barrelly Revenue Office. All persons collecting public assistance are asked to walk with their ID cards. Persons will only be allowed to collect public assistance for a maximum of two persons. For more information, you can visit our Facebook page at API SVG.
And that's how we end the APIs Iron Government. Thank you for viewing. If you've missed any of our past programs, you can catch these on our YouTube or Facebook pages at API SVG or on our website www.api.gov.vc. Until next time, I am Bavin Oliver. Good night.